A new study shows that female ASD diagnosis is now one female for every 3.8 males, which is up from the previous one in four statistic, but that's still a pretty big gap. So what's causing this disparity? Is it those biased clinicians? I'm sorry, you can't have autism. You've been using words this whole time. Is the diagnostic criteria itself biased? It says right here, XY chromosome required. Are girls being referred for evaluations less often? Or are girls actually less likely to having autism in general? We're gonna look at the latest research on all of these, but for starters, my opinion is that the instances of autism in girls and boys is probably closer to being equal or one-to-one. -one. But unfortunately, we can't just go spouting off speculations as fact unless we have the data to back it up, you know, science and whatnot. All we can do is look at some of the causes and work towards closing that gap if it falsely exists. Spoiler alert, I personally think the reason girls are getting diagnosed less often is because society has trouble getting them through those doors to be evaluated in the first place. Why? Because people don't really understand how ASD presents differently in females. An experimental study presented educators with ASD profiles, then correctly identified them with their gender or gave them the opposite gender. Ooh. Plot twist. And here's what they found. Male ASD profiles correctly identified as male got the highest recognition. Male profiles incorrectly identified as female got the second highest recognition. The female profiles incorrectly identified as male got the third highest recognition. And at the very bottom, we have female profiles correctly identified as females. So what does all of this mean? It means that people still picture the male stereotyped behavior as a true picture of autism because it was the two male presentations that were rated the highest. If it was just a matter of people thinking females didn't have autism at all, we would have seen the two female identifications being acknowledged the least, but that's not what we see here. What we see in this experiment is that it's the male presentation that people associate with autism the most. So what is the male presentation and why does it exist? Well, to explain that, we have to go back to the beginning. Nope. Too far back. More like the 1930s and 1940s with these two gentlemen here. Hans Osperger and Leo Kanner, who, between the two of them, began to describe what the diagnostic criteria for autism should look like based off 12 boys and only three girls. So from the jump, the book on autism was based on boys, and once it started out that way, it was hard to get away from it. It became this cyclical monster of more males getting diagnosed, which led to more research being done in males, which further reinforced the male presentation of autism being the correct diagnostic criteria, which led to more males getting diagnosed, which led to... Stop. Just stop it right there. So why were boys getting noticed more in the first place? Quite simply, because their traits are more noticeable. They're more likely to have restricted behaviors and to make repetitive movements and sounds. This includes hand flapping, head shaking, repeating noises or words, or making random rhythmic sounds on a regular basis. They have intense interests that are noticeably more extreme, less age appropriate, and more atypical when compared to their peers. And finally, for social reciprocity, boys will sometimes literally isolate themselves away from peers and play by themselves. They might almost act like they don't even notice other children exist and seem unaware of themselves in relation to the world like Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense. Now, compare that to the contrast of how some of these traits appear in girls. On average, girls exhibit less restricted repetitive behaviors and less stereotypies, meaning they may not do as much vocalizations or hand flapping. Their interests are intense but get overlooked because they seem more typical and more age appropriate. They might be more interested in animals, drawing, reading, or collections. And as far as social reciprocity goes, they're often able to better mask their struggles and mimic their peers. They often insert themselves into peer interactions, but those exchanges aren't always natural, and they may not be accepted by their peers. They may not really fit in anywhere and are more prone to jumping from playgroup to playgroup, and they might do a better job mimicking peer behavior by copying phrases, facial expressions, and even clothing styles. This is very different from boys who may not interact with peers at all. 
So out of those two, which one of these scenarios is more noticeable? The little girl who looks like she's playing with friends or the little boy who's aimlessly wandering around the playground all by himself? It has been shown that females are typically more socially motivated, whereas males are less socially motivated on average. Now, these differences may narrow with age, but it still means girls have been doing this chameleon stuff for a real long time. When looking at the differences between my autistic son and myself, I can say this has been true in our own lives. When he was in fifth grade, his IEP teachers gave him a test to determine what motivates him. The results of that test showed 0% motivated by peer approval or acceptance and 100% motivated by adult approval or acceptance. I mean, 0%, not even 1%. Buddy, don't get me wrong, he did get angry and frustrated by bullying or when peers would trigger his hypersensitivities. But being bothered by peers isn't the same thing as being motivated by peer approval, whereas I was obsessing over a catalog I had created that I called the cool book when I was around his age, documenting the exact clothes and cool school supplies I wanted to buy hoping that would help me to fit in with my peers. I talk about this a little bit more in my childhood traits video, so if you haven't watched that yet, you can go check it out to learn more about what life was like for me in my youth as an undiagnosed girl. Anyway, as you can see, most of the traits exhibited by males are external and most of the female behaviors are internalized. Since autism is diagnosed by observing behaviors, a referral is typically made when behaviors are shown in an external way. When behaviors are in internalized with masking and camouflaging and that person doesn't cause disruptions or problems, they're usually overlooked. Which leads us to the very unbalanced statistic that boys are referred for diagnostic assessments 10 times more often than girls. That doesn't seem fair. Now, the jury is still out on the biases within the diagnostic criteria and the professional community as a whole. Some studies have shown that females have to have more noticeable traits and symptoms to get diagnosed, while others have shown that females are getting diagnosed with less noticeable traits and symptoms. But regardless of any potential biases, girls have zero chances of receiving a diagnosis if we're not even referring them for evaluations to begin with. What all of this means is that there's a huge need to get the word out to parents and educators because they're the frontline advocates for recommending an evaluation in the first place. I can personally vouch for this because it was my son's teacher that recognized the signs of autism in him when we had no idea what autism looked like. But as is all too common, he was presenting the pronounced male phenotype traits which is why he got noticed in the first grade. And I didn't realize I was on the spectrum until almost 40 years old. I thank my lucky stars every day that he was diagnosed or I never would have found this out about myself, but it doesn't make any of these unbalanced statistics any less concerning. If I had one cause to take up for the neurodivergent advocacy, honestly, this might be it. I think it would be great to roll out a program to train educators on spotting these nuanced differences. And you might be thinking, but Jennifer, we don't want parents and teachers thinking every kid is autistic. And no, we don't. We just want the kids who are autistic to get noticed. The assumption that increased knowledge on these differences would automatically cause an uncontrollable pandemic of incorrect diagnoses is a false equivalence. The goal is to relay the information correctly to help those frontline advocates recognize signs that already exist, not to fabricate them where they don't exist. And a referral doesn't equate to an automatic diagnosis. Let's get them to the professionals and let the professionals do their jobs because there are consequences to letting so many of these girls slip through the cracks. For one, they lose out on early interventions that might benefit them. But secondly, we don't know how early recognition affects mental health outcomes. Studies have shown that suicidal ideation is significantly increased for people with ASD. New studies include not only diagnosed people, but people who had these ideations that scored above clinical levels for ASD afterward. It should come as no surprise that females with ASD are at even more risk than males with ASD, and the current data shows that adding in the comorbidity of ADHD pushes that risk even higher. Sure, receiving a diagnosis probably doesn't magically eliminate this risk, but having the awareness that this increased risk exists might help us to put more safeguards and understanding in place, which, if you ask me, it's a pretty big reason all by itself to figure out how we close this diagnosis gap. So 
I'll leave it there. If you'd like to share something for a future video, you can visit my website, neurodivergent.com. Other than that, insert all the obligatory like and subscribe things here. And if you wanna watch another one of my videos, you can do that by clicking somewhere around here. <laughs> Bye for now. Mm.